gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here. It's a great pleasure for four of us to be here today to tell you a little bit about what some of us did last summer. I should say that when we learned that our title of recent discoveries from the sanctuary of Zeus at Mount Lacan had been changed by the organizers to epic discoveries, we all felt just a little added pressure to what we are going to be saying. I think that this should be a very interesting and exciting presentation to be made by all four of us, and I'll briefly explain our roles. As the field director of the excavation, I'll begin by describing a little about the Sanctuary of Zeus, the history of the site, our overall work there, and then telling you something about the nature of the discovery of the skeleton this summer. My colleague and co-director and director of finds, Dr. Mary Voyatsis, will put the discovery into context in the Greek world and talk a little bit about what the discovery may mean. Dr. Aram Park, our colleague from Religious Studies and Classics, will talk about the literary evidence that relates to the possibility of human sacrifice in ancient Greece, and specifically Mount Lacan. And Dr. Courtney Friesen, our colleague also from Religious Studies and Classics, will put the discovery and its possible implications into the context of the Judeo-Christian tradition. This is a scene you're looking out to the northeast from the altar of Zeus at Mount Lacan. The sanctuary of Zeus is one of the most important and famous Zeus sanctuaries in the Greek world. Known as the birthplace of, <coughs> excuse me, the birthplace of Zeus in ancient literature and history, the University of Arizona has been working there since 2004 and we have brought to the site over 250 students during these 13 years. This summer we had 24 students working with us, 15 of whom were students or alums of the U of A from classics, anthropology, engineering, and architecture. We worked together with our colleagues from the Greek Archaeological Service as representatives of the Ministry of Culture, and we collaborate on all aspects of our project. Our Greek co-director is Dr. Anna, Dr. Anna Karapanayotu, and this is a picture of our Greek-American team from this summer. Each member of our team worked long and hard hours and contributed importantly to our successful season, and I thank each one of them individually for their contributions. The Sanctuary of Zeus is located high in the Arcadian Mountains in the West Central Peloponnese that you see here with the red dot. To give you some idea of its location, it's only 22 miles as the eagle flies from the sanctuary of Zeus at Olympia to the northwest. There are two parts of the sanctuary of Zeus. The older part, the ash altar of Zeus, is found at the southern peak of the mountain at 1,382 meters above sea level. 200 meters lower in elevation is a mountain meadow where are located athletic and administrative facilities for the famous athletic festival in honor of Zeus. There exists a stadium for human contests, a, hip a hippodrome for equestrian contests, the only example of which is visible in the Greek world, a bath facility, an administrative building, a colonnaded building, seats or steps, and two fountain houses. The lower sanctuary was refurbished in the 4th century BC, and the standing remains date generally to that time. The entire area of the sanctuary, high and low, is over one square kilometer in area. It's a huge place. We worked in a number of different locations in the mountain meadow this summer, having a total of seven active trenches. That is, seven active trenches in the lower sanctuary. We had 18 students and workmen involved, here are a few highlights. This is a plan of the lower sanctuary on the left. We worked at both ends of a 31 meter long stone corridor discovering a series of nine steps at the south end and the beginning of an arch still in the scarp at the north end. You see the arch at the bottom here. The corridor likely channeled athletes from the heart of the lower sanctuary to the stadium and the hippodrome. Although we had found portions of the corridor between 2006 and 2010, we had not previously found either end. 
This was our largest and longest trench by far, 31 meters long. We discovered the remains of what, be, what may be related to the sanctuary of Pan, a second famous sanctuary, but for a different god at the site of Mount Lycaon, described by the ancient author Pausanias. This photograph shows several water pipes in a stone basin with the excavators John Keck and Jake Ashton in situ. The trench is quite, <clears throat> quite deep, and much, much effort was expended getting to the level of the find. Digging within the huge administrative building, we found a beautiful terracotta cyma block, a part of the decorated roof with painted decoration that you see here. This will help us in our reconstruction of what the building must have looked like. Again, this is a fourth century building. We also cleared a portion of what must have been the floor of the Hippodrome, the race course for equestrian contests. And here on the right, Jay Stevens explains the floor to our team at the end of the season. The sanctuary was earlier excavated by the Archaeological Society of Athens in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The primary excavator, Constantinos Kurignotis, excavated at both the upper and lower sanctuaries and found evidence for the sanctuary of Zeus in the form of figurines of Zeus seen here. Although he found the altar and a sacred precinct, he did not find a temple, nor have we. In our earlier work at the altar, 2007 to 2010, we had found several images of Zeus, including his bronze hand, seen here holding a silver lightning bolt. I should say that, in fact, this bronze hand is only a few millimeters large. But due to the efficiency of digital photography, it looks big. This is a 5th century BC Arcadian League coin showing the seated Lacan Zeus on the reverse here on the right. So we have found Zeus at the Zeus Sanctuary. Turning now to our work this summer at the Altar of Zeus at the southern peak of the mountain, um, which you see here in a modern photograph, um, the altar is at the very pinnacle of the mountain and the Temenos, or sacred area, uh, 20 meters below. The size of the altar is approximately 30 meters in diameter, and it approximates a circle. By the end of 2010, we had dug a long trench, Trench Z, on the altar, 14 14 by 2 meters in size, and one that you can actually see in this uh, Google satellite image. An ash altar is a primitive type of altar, which in this case consists of the remains of animal dedications burned directly on the bedrock of the mountaintop without any kind of architectural foundation or any, any building. So what you find is black ash on top of the bedrock of the mountain mixed with small bone fragments, stones, dedications, and pottery. During the course of the excavation between 2006 and 2010, we had found evidence immediately above the bedrock level for Mycenaean activity in the form of hundreds of Mycenaean kilikis, or drinking cups found together with terracotta figurines, both human and animal seen here being excavated by Dan Diffendale. The animal sacrifices burned femurs of goats and sheep begins in the 16th century BC. And more about this will be discussed by Dr. Voyatsis. All of this suggests a Mycenaean shrine on the mountaintop. We also had found much earlier material from the late Neolithic, early Helladic, and Middle Helladic periods, roughly the fourth millennium through the second millennium BC. Two other significant points should be mentioned. The animals were 98% goat and sheep, and the bones burned were 98% femur, patella, and tailbone. We also found that the burning of the animal bones continues uninterrupted from the 16th century BC to the Hellenistic period around 300 BC, indicating a continuity of cult, uh, including a very important Iron Age presence. Since the altar is known to be identified with Zeus in the historical period, it is suggestive that Zeus was worshiped here from the Mycenaean period. In four, work, four years of work at the altar, we had found no evidence of human bones, despite the fact that Mount Lacaine is mentioned 
numerous times in ancient literature from the historical period and on a number of occasions as the site of human sacrifice. There was also in ancient mythology a story of the early figure Lycaon who had sacrificed his son on the altar of Zeus at Mount Lycaon. And more on this to be heard from Dr. Aram Karp. During the excavation of the altar in 2009 and 2010, we came across an interesting area at the bottom of the trench and at the very summit of the southern peak that was different from what we had found before. It was no longer bedrock, that is the native rock of the mountain, but rather what we described as an architectural platform. Field stones that were placed on top of bedrock by man and in some form of order. We noticed that the line of stones were oriented due north, and one stone in particular was exceptionally large and flat, right at the edge of the trench, here circled. Uh, so you see the north arrow, north is coming at you there, and the, uh, the um, exceptionally large and flat rock circled in red. When we resumed our excavations this year, our first objective at the altar was to pursue the architectural platform that seemed to go into the western scarp of the trench, as you see here. We wanted to know more about what it was, what was the significance of the north orientation of the stones, and what did the large flat stone indicate. So we laid out a trench to the west, first two by two meters, then expanded to two by four meters. And what we found exactly in the middle of the trench was a human burial, oriented close to east-west. It was the 4th of July. From this day onward until the close of excavations at the end of the month, the altar team worked overtime to complete the excavation of the burial, to fully document the discovery, and to prepare the skeleton and burial for removal to Athens. I would thank our trench supervisor, Stephanie Martin, and our assistant field director, Kyle Mahoney, for their efforts in these areas. And here they are on the first day of the discovery. That is the right tibia of the skeleton that they're exposing in the middle of the slide. Whereas between 2007 and 2010, we had a physical anthropologist or a faunal specialist working with us, in this year, 2016, for a variety of reasons, we did not. The first order of business was to find a physical anthropologist who could assist us with the excavation of the human skeleton, and we did that right away. Through the courtesy of the director of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, James Wright, we found Dr. Eliana Prevedoru, a Greek national and a recent PhD from Arizona State University working at the Wiener Lab at the American School. She came immediately and worked with us for the next three weeks supplementing our team of six to eight students assigned to the altar. Here is a brief clip of Dr. Prevedoro at work on the area of the burial near the mandible of the skeleton. There's not much sound here, but you can hear the wind and you can hear the tool being used and you can hear George Davis in the background. Always with us. Assignment. It must go lower. This was July 13th. I'll be your support. But you can see the detailed work, the very painstaking, slow, careful work uh, just to expose one part of one bone. The discovery was pretty exciting for our team and for our team leaders. Here you see Tom Keating wearing his finest U of A apparel, together with our Greek colleague, Dr. Karapanayotu, seeing the excavation up close, uh, and it's Dr. Uh, Prevedoro who is under the green tarpaulin there, uh, working in the heat of the sun. The burial and our trench was found near the high point of the southern peak of the mountain and also close to the center of the circular shaped altar that you can see in this Google image. So the red circle here 
is an outline of the altar that can be picked up from the satellite, which we cannot see on the ground. And you can see the location of the trench uh, within the uh, circle, very close to the center. Here is a photograph of the excavated burial with stones covering the midsection of the skeleton on the left and with the stones removed on the right. The characteristics of the burial were the following. The burial is a very simple one, resting mostly on bedrock, that is the native rock of the mountaintop, and set between irregular slabs of fieldstone. It was found roughly in an east-west orientation with the head toward the west. The skeleton is that of an adolescent, probably male, approximately 1.52 meters in length. The skeleton was largely complete but lacking the cranium. The mandible is present. The central portion of the skeleton was covered with a series of flat fieldstones, as you see on the left, uh, following we removed the central stones. Pottery was found mixed above and below the burial. There were no grave goods found with the skeleton. Pottery found underneath the stones covering the midsection of the skeleton date to the 11th century BC. The remainder of the skeleton was not covered by stones. Ash covered the burial with animal bone and was found in and around the skeleton. There was not time at the end of the season to process all the important pottery and finds before packing up, and as a result, our discussion this afternoon needs to remain very preliminary. Between the burial and the architectural platform of stone to the east was found an area of jumbled stones, which you see here on the screen, on which were found a profusion of high-quality pottery of mixed dates. In addition, in our previous excavations, we had found several Mycenaean terracotta animal figurines on the architectural platform, suggesting the importance of the place from an earlier time. So here is what we know and what we don't know. We have an ancient burial of an adolescent, probable male, that may be from the 11th century. It is found immediately to the west of an area of dedications, immediately to the east of the altar, sorry, immediately to the east of the area of dedications is the architectural platform that may well be the altar itself. The burial is found next to the high point of the mountain and is located near the center of the altar. We don't know why the burial is oriented almost due east. We don't know for certain the date of the burial. We don't know the identity of the in individual. We don't know how the individual died. We don't know if there are going to be additional burials found nearby. With the cooperation of the Greek Archaeological Service and our colleagues in the Tripolis Ephoria and Dr. Kara Panayotu in particular, and the American School of Classical Studies, the skeleton has been moved from Mount Lacan to the brand new Malcolm H. Wiener Laboratory for Archaeological Science of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, where it will undergo cleaning, conservation, and study under the supervision of Dr. Prevedoru. A part of the study will include several scientific tests to be undertaken at the University of Arizona's Accelerator Mass Spectrometry Lab under the direction of Dr. Greg Hodgins that may give us more information about the individual. Bone samples will be taken for carbon-14 dating. Tooth samples will be taken for isotopic studies that may be able to determine, for instance, the region of Greece from which the individual came. Now to the question on everybody's mind. Is this an example of human sacrifice? Well, we don't know. However, there is some suggestive evidence. First, the burial was found towards the middle of a sacrificial altar to Zeus at Mount Lacan, where thousands and thousands of animal dedications were made at least as early as the 16th century BC. Second, it is found immediately adjacent to an area of important pottery and terracotta dedications. Third, the area of dedications are adjacent to the architectural platform of stones, suggesting an altar. Fourth, 
there is the ancient literary evidence discussing human sacrifice at Mount Lycaon and the ancient myth of Lycaon, Lycaon, who sacrificed his son on this altar in myth. On the other hand, could this be a later burial of an individual on the site of an earlier burial? Yes, this is possible, although we found no ceramic evidence to suggest that this was the case. It could also be possible that this was an earlier burial that had been revisited and modified. So we need to wait for the physical anthropologist and the scientists to do their studies before we know more, perhaps during this year. But of course, we, at the urging of the Greek Archaeological Service, needed to prepare a press release in August with a very, very cautious description of our discovery, which we did. The result was that there were some interesting headlines around the world featuring the words dark, sinister, gruesome, and chilling. I'm sure that some of you may have seen these. This one from the Smithsonian was cautious. Did the ancient Greeks engage in human sacrifice? This one from the Guardian announces a confirmation of ancient Greek sacrifice, which of course we were careful not to include in our press release. And this one from Forbes, what does ancient human sacrifice look like? So there are very few examples of documented human sacrifice from the Greek world and none from mainland Greece. There is no example from a sacrificial altar that is also known from literary evidence as the site of human sacrifice, but this could be the first. There are other examples of human sacrifice in the ancient Mediterranean world, the most important of which is probably that at Carthage from a later date where a cemetery of infant burials has been found. Several ancient authors describe this human sacrifice in detail, and one of them, Theophrastus, mentions Mount Lycaon together with Carthage. I will now gladly turn the podium over to my colleague, Dr. Mary Voyatsis. Thank you very much to Dean Duran and Dr. Seat and Tom Keating for your wonderful words. And um, I'm going to pick up where David Romano left off. We've heard from Dr. Romano about all the exciting and important discoveries. We put on a new slide here. Uh, from Mount Lacan in the past seasons, and especially from 2016. I would now like to talk a little bit more about how we know what sorts of activities took place at the mountaintop. And when were they taking place? In other words, how can we establish an accurate chronology? And finally, what is the significance of our discoveries in the context of the larger Greek world? So we're going to start with what we know. We know that there was an offering, there were offerings of burnt animal sacrifice taking place on the site. How do we know? Hundreds and even thousands of kilos of animal bones were found throughout the altar in all layers. And as Dr. Romano already said, 98% of them were burnt, mostly from sheep and goat. And here we see the uh, bones that were mentioned earlier, the femurs and the patellas and to a lesser extent, the tail bones that are in blue. So you see the femur is the thigh bone, and the patella, which is sort of attached, but some became disattached, disattached. Um, so they were often found separately um, in the uh, ash altar. So these are signs of ritual sacrifice. And I just want to take a minute to say that ritual can be defined as repeated actions governed by rules and traditions carried out in the same way each time. Luckily for us, Ritual actions can leave a material trace in, in the record. And we, what we have here is ritual sacrifice, the same kind of bones over and over again, the same types of animals, in this case sheep and goat. There's a little bit of, of uh, uh, cattle and pig, uh, but mostly 98% sheep and goat with the same treatment. Uh, and these were offerings to Zeus. Later literary evidence from the 8th century BC and later from Homer, Hesiod, and other ancient authors discuss uh, the practice and the tradition of offering thigh bones from the animal wrapped in fat. And you can see this here in these two red figure pots. The one on the right actually shows the burning of the uh, animal bone, the thigh bones wrapped in fat. And the one on the left actually shows the animal being brought. It's sort of a conflated image. The animal being brought, it's going to be sacrificed. They're going to cut out the thigh bone, and they're pouring the wine from the oinakoi, the jug. And they also have some grain. So it's everything happening all at once. 
This practice was widespread throughout the Greek world in the historic period and was offered to most of the gods in the same way. After the sacrifice, there would be a communal meal where you'd eat the rest of the animal. What about the date of our bones? They are found throughout the altar, even on the lowest bedrock level, though somewhat less at the very, very bottom. So what you see here is a stratigraphy of the ash altar. And on the far right, you have the deepest south end, and that is where there was a burn center. There was fire, crack, rock, and lots of ash, and lots of evidence of burning where there might have been a fire, uh, where they were um, uh, burning the sacrifices. And then on the, uh, you see its circle where the, some of the fire, crack, rock was found. And then um, on the highest point of the altar on bedrock is where that platform was that uh, David Romano was talking about. And that is a shallower, uh, has a shallower collection of, of buildup above it. Um, so we have this practice of uh, offering these animal bones all the way down to bedrock. And if you look at the lowest bedrock level, you can see it's a slightly different color. And that is where the Mycenaean pottery was found. And it goes all the way along up to a certain point anyway. Uh, we, micromorphology was done, which is a microscopic analysis of the soil by Susan Menser, Dr. Susan Menser, who has her PhD from the University of Arizona. And it confirms that the entire altar was composed of pulverized bone and ash mixed with the fines. So this, there's not really a lot of earth except right at bedrock. It is all uh, ash and, and uh, pulverized bone. Bones were found in association with the Mycenaean pottery uh, on the bedrock level. So they appear to be from, say, the 16th century until through the 12th century BC. This is a big deal because there's not, there's not a lot of evidence in the Greek world of burnt animal sacrifice from the Mycenaean period. We wanted to do carbon-14 analysis uh, to make sure that we were understanding what we were finding. Uh, and this was conducted on bones and charcoal and seeds from a number of the layers. What you see here is a cross-section from one of the deep southern trenches. And we, I don't know if this will show up here, probably not. Yeah. We cut a little, two columns, uh, and this is the bedrock layer here, and uh, here we have the, what we call the Mycenaean layer, uh, and then 132 is probably the early Iron Age, and then this is an archaic layer up here. But we did smaller, more fine-grained uh, little um, uh, uh, sections, and we took some bones, some animal bones, some charcoal, and some seeds. Um, so we had 30 calcined or heavily burnt bones, 15 seeds, and 15 pieces of charcoal. And the carbon-14 analysis was done here at the U of A uh, by Dr. Britt Starkovich and Dr. Greg Hodgins. The results were very impressive, and they indicate that the practice of uh, burnt animal sacrifice indeed goes back to the 16th century. What you're looking at here are, whoops, sorry is you can see here, this is the lowest level, 139. This is burnt bone, burnt bone, and charcoal. And you see the date, 1600, between 1600 and 1200. So it's sort of in this area, 1527, plus or minus 97 years. This is definitely right in the early part of the Mycenaean period. We also have a big increase in burnt animal bone in the early Iron Age, which is the majority of it over on this side. This was very important. Uh, some of the earliest evidence we have in the Greek world. Um, so we see a big increase in the, from the, after the 11th century. And just to put things into context, most Greek sanctuaries in Greece don't begin until after the 11th century. And they don't start to get temples and elaborate offerings until the 8th or 7th century. So we're talking about early uh, developments here. There are other sites uh, that have later Mycenaean evidence for burnt animal sacrifice, in particular Pylos, uh, the, the so-called Palace of Nestor at Pylos. Uh, in the area around the palace, there were lots of uh, burnt cattle bones. Let's see here. They were found in different parts, uh, in this little room here and in the courtyards, 10 cattle burnt. And again, only certain parts indicating ritual, the, the femur the humerus, and in this case also the mandible. Um, but at around 1200 BC, that palace is destroyed, and the, the, the uh, 
activity does not continue there, whereas at Mount Lacan it does seem to continue more or less uninterrupted until the third century BC. Also, Mount Lacan is a religious site, whereas here we're dealing with a palace site, so it's a different kind of context. So, we know that animal sacrifice was going on at the altar. That was the main activity. We also know that there was the offering of votive offerings, the, 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 the dedication of votive offerings, and other ritual objects uh, at the site. Here are some of the little terracotta animals that were found. There were also human, animal fig uh, human figurines found, uh, also dating to the Mycenaean period. Uh, this is typical. You find these at other cult places, uh, at Mycenae, at Tiryns, at Philacopi. Um, and these were, the ones that I have on the screen now, were found for the most part near that platform that we were talking about earlier. Um, also, ritual objects were found, like these terracotta uh, ascoi, which are bird-shaped ritual vessels. Uh, so this is another indication that we're dealing with uh, a cult place. The practice of making offerings to the gods continues into the Iron Age and is common at all Greek sanctuaries. But later on, you get more metal offerings, even coins, as we saw earlier. And here we see some of the bronze miniature tripods that were found in large numbers at Mount Lycaon. Um, often they're found in huge, on a huge scale at some of the sanctuaries like Olympia, Delphi, uh, Ithaca, Athens. But we have the tiniest ones of all. They're very, very small miniature offerings and very distinctive. So we have the offerings, we have the bones. We also have libations and ritual drinking that was going on at the site. We have tons of pottery that was found, as was mentioned earlier. This is from Bedrock Layer. And you see these Mycenaean drinking vessels, or kyliches, that were mentioned earlier. And a kylix is really just a drinking cup with a long stem. And you can see some of the stems here, right? You see these stems? They're still dirty. They're unwashed. We have bases. Oh my gosh, we had so many of them. And, um, but they clean up really well. And then you can draw them and study them and devote the rest of your life to them, which is what I'm planning to do. Um, so, so you see, for example, here we have a nice uh, stem that's been cleaned up and washed. Uh, here we have a whole pot. This was found near the platform, this piece right here. S they have different shapes. Some of them have an angular body. Some of them have a rounded body. They have different kinds of decoration. And there are also other kinds of drinking vessels. Some of them have, um, uh, uh, they're more like bowls. And then as time goes on, they change even more. So there's a typology that we have to establish in order to be able to date the activities. Um, because this is a, a regional style of pottery, and it takes a little while. What we can say is that most of the vessels, 95% of them, come from some sort of drinking vessel, either a kylix or a cup or a deep bowl. And, um, they are largely, there's a preference for Mycenaean kyliches, uh, but uh, there are many others as well. And these Mycenaean drinking vessels are found, for the most part, on bedrock, but they're also found above, mixed. Uh, so the kylix, I should say, also is a popular vessel type in, My in the Mycenaean period for feasting generally. Um, and the pottery shows connections with other regions, uh, Laconia, Messenia, and other areas as well. So we, David mentioned earlier the final Neolithic, early Helladic, and middle Helladic pottery, the much earlier pottery. I'm not showing you any of that now, um, but it has a different character, at least until um, middle Helladic three. but never mind. You don't have to know that for the test. OK. Um, I'm showing you this slide. This slide is really important, and you may not appreciate it, but it dates to the period after the palaces uh, are destroyed or damaged or collapse uh, in the 12th century BC. And most cult places, and uh, many cult places, and most sites um, show uh, a decline or a complete stop. Our site continues, and these are some of the pieces that can attest to that, because they fall into this gap between the end of the Bronze Age, or near the end of the Bronze Age, and the beginning of a new phase, the Iron Age. So this pottery, this 12th and 11th century pottery, is important and allows us to talk about continuity of cult. Then we, when we get into the early Iron Age, we have some distinctive bowls that change now, because the, the kylix, 
stops being made for the most part, except in some uh, particular cases. And we have a distinctive West Greek style of pottery that's also found at Messenia in the Peloponnese on the island of Ithaca, which is one of the Ionian islands to the west. And then you can see the Mount Lycaon examples on the bottom. Uh, also, we have examples of this from Olympia. So we're starting to get a sense of our site within the larger Peloponnese from about 1050 BC on. Just to show you some of the places I was talking about. So here's Mount Lycaon. This is Messenia. There are a number of sites where uh, that West Greek style pottery was found. And then Olympia is right here. And the island of Ithaca is here. And if you follow the rivers, you can kind of get a sense. We also have other evidence coming from Laconia or Sparta, this area. So if you follow the rivers, you get a sense of these pathways that might have connected people and also pottery and activity. So it opens up all sorts of new kinds of research. OK, how can we establish a chronology? Well, I've touched upon it already. You need to understand your local pottery. Um, the carbon-14 helps a lot because it, it allows us to get some fixed dates for the bones. Um, here we're looking at the platform again, that uh, at the top of the altar, and some of the pots that were found in the vicinity. They're all drinking vessels, and they span the Mycenaean uh, more or less. This is an earlier piece. This is a, a little bit later, later still, and then going into the early Iron Age. And there's also a piece of the Middle Hellatic that I don't show you here. So we think that this had a long period of use. Um, so. These are all ways that we can date the, this, uh, the, the activities that happen at our site. So then, what is the significance of our discoveries, and how can we begin to make sense of that skeleton found in the middle of the altar? I think we can now say, we can make a, a reasonable case that the worship of Zeus goes back to the Mycenaean period. It's not so hard to accept it now. For one thing, we have the Linear B texts, which are these uh, clay tablets that were found at many of the Mycenaean sites. It's a syllabic script. They were the records that the pa palaces kept. And uh, it was deciphered and found to be a very archaic form of the Greek language. And these texts mention Zeus, as well as other gods, as recipients of offerings. So the name, we know, goes back to the Bronze Age. We have also evidence of burnt uh, animal sacrifice from our site as well as other sites. And now the evidence of continuity from Mount Lycan strengthens the case even more that Zeus's worship uh, probably goes back to the late Bronze Age. Before that, we don't know. Maybe some sort of a nature deity or something else was going on. It is notable, though, that Mount Lacan does not develop like other sites in the historic period. It's old-fashioned. It has no temple. And it has this continuity of cult. So what is the relationship to Olympia? Olympia was mentioned at the beginning. It's not so far away. It had a fifth century temple here. You see it, uh, not the column knocked down at the end of antiquity. And it was reported to have a huge ash altar. Sound familiar? There's no trace of the ash altar, though, at Olympia. Only Pausanias' description of it, made of ash and thigh bones from the victims. And uh, sounds very much like our altar. Uh, but it was eroded away. Only the black, ashy soil remained. Um, the Germans have been digging there for over 100 years. Whoops, sorry. And they found um, recently some pottery. The earlier pottery was all thrown away. They found some pottery, and they found these kyliches that continued to be made into the, uh, the end of the Bronze Age, into the early Iron Age, with these ribbed stems, allowing them to date the earliest activity to the 11th century, which means that Mount Lycaon is some 500 years earlier. The cult of Zeus goes back earlier. Certainly, the ritual activity goes back earlier. OK, what about now our human skeleton? found in the middle of the altar beyond the platform, covered in ash and burnt animal bones. We don't have any other evidence from a sacrificial altar like this, as David Romano said. Oriented to the east, simple burial, no grave goods, missing a cranium. How can we date the body? Well, underneath those stones that were um, here in the pelvic area, there was Mycenaean pottery. Some of it was fairly early. The latest piece was, I think, this piece right here with the zigzag that probably dates to the end of the Mycenaean period. So that's why we say the 11th century to be on the safe side. But we may be wrong. Could be earlier, could be later. I hope not. Um, and, then, and then here we have one of these ribs from one of those ribbed 
uh, Kylik, Kylikis that are the very latest uh, style that may be, might even be 10th century, but this was not found under the stone. It was found in rubble above the burial. So in a way, it fits the chronology as well. We should say, though, that we haven't washed and studied all the pottery. We didn't have time, so uh, we have to wait and see. And carbon-14 will also help us confirm the date. So one last um, point I want to make is the cemetery that's found quite near Mount Lacan at Palio Castro. And it is right here. Uh, this is a close-up of the ash altar. On the other side of the Alfeos River are these to the cemetery at Palio Castro, where over 100 tombs were found. Um, it is a cemetery, not an altar. Um, and uh, only preliminary re uh, publications have been made so far. It was dug in the 50s and again in the 80s. And these tombs were rich. Many of them were rock-cut chamber tombs with long passageways or dromoi and rich grave goods. The date of these tombs are 12th and 11th century BC, at the, after the palaces had been destroyed and at a time of, of movements of population, some turmoil. Uh, but the people who were buried here were, were, were prominent people with really major grave goods. Uh, the tombs were very impressive and there were uh, br brilliant bronze swords. These are called warrior graves. They're found in many sites, not just here, in various parts of the Peloponnese. The pottery is spectacular. I would give anything to have one whole pot or even part of one of these whole pots. They're huge. They're, some of them are 40 centimeters tall. They're beautifully decorated. They show connections with Attica, with Laconia, with Argos, and believe it or not, with Crete, showing that this period, the late 12th and early 11th century, there was a lot of movement of population. And the people who settled Nearby, we don't know, the settlement hasn't been found, um, but these people were uh, uh, elite uh, people for sure. Uh, there's also some unpublished pottery in the Tripoli Museum from the more recent excavations, um, and some of that pottery looks similar to our material. In other words, I think the uh, um, burial is equated to a later phase of that, the use of that cemetery, a Palio Castro. Um, so maybe the Palio Castro Cemetery and its as yet unidentified settlement is somehow connected to the burial at Mount Lycaon during a time of turmoil in the Greek world and the transition to the early Iron Age. Okay, the finds from Mount Lycaon put the site into a broader Peloponnesian and Greek context. We now know that we have very early ritual activity at the altar, arguably uh, Mycenaean worship of Zeus, earlier than Olympia, continuous activity from the late bronze to the early Iron Age transition, connections with various sites in the Peloponnese, Laconia, Messenia, and elsewhere, and now a surprising human skeleton, likely of an adolescent male, and I should note a premature death. This isn't uh, someone who's lived their life, uh, an early death, in a prominent location in the middle of the altar conceivably where ritual offering of burnt animal sacrifices were taking place for 500 years before and 800 years after the burial. The fact that so many ancient texts refer to the practice of human sacrifice at the altar at Mount Lycaon requires that we consider this possibility as we try to make sense of our discovery and, as, and also as we do the scientific analyses and further excavations to see if there are any more bodies, right? I wonder, is it possible, and this is just me talking, that some tragic event occurred at the site with our young man, something unrecorded in the ancient texts, which, but which may have led to his unusual burial, and it is an unusual burial, you don't have this sort of thing happening, at the ash altar, and which may in turn have given rise to the stories of the myths of human sacrifice. As we can see, there is much more to think about and explore further, but for now, let us turn our attention to Dr. Aaron Park, who will talk about to us about the fascinating textual evidence for human sacrifice at Mount Lycaon and in the ancient Greek world more generally. Thank you. Okay, so I've been asked to talk about the textual and mythical traditions surrounding Mount Lycaon, specifically concerning its reputation for practicing human sacrifice. Um, first, I should clarify that what we generally mean by sacrifice is ritual slaughter or um, killing done in a ritual way to serve a re religious purpose. But, um, but my colleague, Dr. Friesen, will prompt us to think a bit more expansively about this in a few minutes. 
for the ancient Greeks, as Professor Voyatis told us, this kind of sacrifice typically meant burnt animal sacrifice, the practice of which in myth was inaugurated by Prometheus when he served up the fat and bones to Zeus and reserved the flesh for human consumption. This kind of sacrifice is described quite frequently in the Homeric poems, and there is archaeological evidence for it occurring at Mount Lycaon and all over the Greek world. But when it comes to human sacrifice, as we've already heard, it seems pretty rare in actual practice. And even in mythology, the few examples of human sacrifice, the ritual killing of a, of a human being, indicate some kind of abnormality or atrocity. The most famous example is the sacrifice of Iphigenia by her father, Agamemnon. Uh, many of us are familiar with this story, which, uh, which says that the goddess Artemis demands the sacrifice of Agamemnon's daughter, Iphigenia, in return for favorable sailing conditions, co weather conditions that will enable the Greeks to sail to Troy and start the Trojan War. This is a story told by the tragedian Aeschylus, who frames the sacrifice as an atrocity and a death that sets off a string of revenge killings. Iphigenia is described as an innocent, undeserving of death, as we can see in the passage I've included here. And her prayers and cries of father, and her maiden years they let go for nothing, those arbiters eager for battle. And her father told his servants after a prayer to lift her face downwards like a goat above the altar, as she fell about his robes to implore him with all her heart. And with her robe of saffron dye streaming downwards, she shot each of the sacrificers with a piteous dart from her eye. Iphigenia is killed in the manner of an animal sacrifice, and the description of her here elicits pity and sympathy for her and anger at Agamemnon. Her death becomes the motive for the murder of Agamemnon by her mother Clytemnestra. As far as how Mount Lycaon fits into all this, there is a mythical figure, Lycaon, who is supposed to have been the eponymous founder of the cult of Zeus Lycaeus, or Ly Lycaeus, at Mount Ly Lycaon, and he supposedly inaugurates the practice of human sacrifice there. As with Iphigenia, in the Lycaon myth, we see the idea of specifically human sacrifice, ritual killing of humans, as something appalling and odious. But the Lycaon tradition also includes the added components of cannibalism and, of course, lycanthropy, werewolves. Happy Halloween. Uh, Lycaon's name was etymologized as coming from the Greek word for wolf, leukos or lykos. There are several variants of the Lycaon myth, a few of which I'll discuss here. Um, one of them comes from the Roman poet Ovid, who talks about Lycaon as an example of human impiety. Jupiter travels among humans in disguise, but other humans recognize him and offer prayers to him. Lycaon, though, only, not only mocks these other humans, he even kills and cooks a human and serves it to Jupiter as a test of the god's omniscience. Jupiter detects the trick, of course, and punishes Lycaon by destroying his house with thunderbolts and turning him into a wolf. But this isn't enough. Ju Jupiter also decides to punish all of mankind by eradicating it with a great flood, a decision that our poet Ovid seems to characterize as an abuse of power when he has Jupiter say, so one house died, but not one house alone deserves to die. In the whole world, sin reigns, conspiracy of crime. Soon on them all, my sentence stands, due punishment shall fall. In Pausanias, we see a variation that connects Lycaon to Mount Lycaon itself. As Pausanias tells us, Cecrops was the first to name Zeus the supreme god and refused to sacrifice anything that had life in it but burnt instead on the altar the national cakes which the Athenians still call Pelanoi. But Lycaon brought a human baby to the altar of Lycian Zeus and sacrificed it, sacrificed it, pouring out its blood upon the altar, and according to the legend, immediately after the sacrifice, he was changed from a man to a wolf. 
Note that Lycaon here, as a leader of his own city, is expressly contrasted with a leader in Athens who doesn't sacrifice living creatures, let alone humans. Pausanias goes on to communicate the widespread belief that the phenomenon of temporary lycanthropy, werewolf transformation, began with Lycaon. All through the ages, many events that have occurred in the past and even some that occur today have been generally discredited because of the lies built up on a foundation of fact. It is said, for instance, that ever since the time of Lycaon, a man has changed into a wolf at the sacrifice to Lycian Zeus, but that the change is not for life. If, when he is a wolf, he abstains from human flesh, after nine years he becomes a man again. But if he tastes human flesh, he remains a beast forever. It's clear that Pausanias himself is skeptical. He later says, those who like to listen to the miraculous are themselves apt to add to the marvel, and so they ruin truth by mixing it with falsehood. This skepticism suggests that the reputation of Mount Lycaon for human sacrifice and lycanthropy held some perverse fascination for the rest of the Greek world even if they didn't fully believe it, per se. This leads me to my last couple of uh, words about, my, uh, about the tradition surrounding the reputed ritual practices at Mount Lycaon. Plato refers to human sacrifice at Mount Lycaon in the context of a discussion about the ideal city and its four stages of decline. Tyranny is the final and worst stage, and this is where Plato's reference to Mount Lycaon occurs. What is the beginning of the transformation from leader of the people to tyrant? Isn't it clear that it happens when the leader begins to behave like the man in the story told about the temple of Lycian Zeus in Arcadia? That anyone who tastes of the one bit of human innards that's chopped up with those of other sacrificial victims must inevitably become a wolf. Then doesn't the same thing happen with a leader of the people who dominates a docile mob and doesn't restrain himself from spilling kindred blood? He brings someone to trial on false charges and murders him, as tyrants so often do, and by thus blotting out a human life, his impious tongue and lips taste kindred citizen blood. He banishes some, kills others, and drops hints to the people about the cancellation of debts and the redistribution of land. And because of the, these things, isn't a man like that inevitably fated either to be killed by his enemies or to be transformed from a man into a wolf by becoming a tyrant? Here, Plato compares tyrants to werewolves. I don't think I have to spell out that both tyrants and werewolves must have been deemed horrific by Plato's audience. I will say, though, that Plato's smooth deployment of lycanthropy as a metaphor that lycanthropy so naturally lends itself to metaphor, suggests that even in Greek antiquity, the supposed practice of human sacrifice and subsequent metamorphosis into a werewolf at Mount Lycaon must have been more the stuff of legend or folklore than established fact. Finally, we have, finally we have several sources, two, only two of which I summarize here, that specifically link a particular anecdote about human sacrifice with the tradition of lycanthropy at Mount Lycaon. They describe an Arcadian ritual of isolating a boy from the rest of his people and his subsequent transformation into a wolf. After a period of nine years, he changes back and rejoins his people so long as he abstains from eating human flesh. They talk about a certain boy, Demonetus, to whom this actually happens. His metamorphosis occurs when he tastes some of the sacrifice in which human entrails were mixed, and after his restoration to human form 10 years later, he goes on to become an Olympic boxer. So what's notable about this is the idea of lycanthropy being temporary and coincident with the separation of a young boy from the rest of society a situation that sounds very much like a rite of passage. Human sacrifice, cannibalism, and lycanthropy seem to function as parallels or metaphors for ritual separation before restoration and reintegration. So just a few concluding thoughts. Any human sacrifice in myth and in literature seems to be appalling or at best sickly fascinating. 
the added components of cannibalism and metamorphosis associated with Mount Lycaon further emphasize this atrocity and link it to abuses of power or crises or departures from the norm and may have parallels in ritual separation and re reintegration. And I should also emphasize that up until this summer's find, the more fantastical elements of the traditions surrounding Mount Lycaon were purely legend. Stories about human sacrifice at Mount Lycaon, let alone cannibalism and you know werewolves, were purely folklore. Just fascination with this exotic, fantastical practice in one corner of the Greek world that wasn't borne out by the archaeological record. But now we suddenly have a human body at the sanctuary, so it will be very interesting to see what more we can learn from this find and how it may link up, even in a tiny way, with the literary and mythical traditions of human sacrifice and how it might affect our own thinking about those traditions. Now it's time for... <laughs> Human sacrifice has consistently been characterized as something done by others. In fact, one of the reasons why scholars find many ancient literary accounts of human sacrifice dubious is that they often emerge from polemical contexts in which outrageous religious rituals are detailed as evidence of moral deficiency. The same tendency can be found among some moderns who look upon ancient society as unenlightened and inferior to our own. So when we find evidence for human sacrifice, it serves to reinforce the narrative that our society has advanced beyond our uncivilized ancestors. In our enlightened world, we understand that a god, if one were to in fact exist, would never demand a human life. Yet, while the idea of human sacrifice is repugnant to us, and thus we project it onto others and never ourselves, its legacy persists for us in more ways than we may realize. In its broadest form, whether we like it or not, our society continues to accept the premise that there are certain situations in which one human life may be forfeited for the greater collective good. This conviction underlies, for example, at one extreme, capital punishment, and at the other, the courageous heroism of our service women and men who all too frequently die to preserve our security, a phenomenon to which we continue to apply the term sacrifice. Now the persistence of this term, sacrifice, may be in part a reflection of the legacy of ancient human sacrifice upon our own culture. This influence is mediated, I would suggest, most powerfully by the Bible and the religious traditions of Judaism and Christianity that emerge from it. The writers of the so-called Hebrew Bible, or Old Testament, were profoundly troubled by human sacrifice, and they denounced it as an abomination, attributing it to the cult practices of others, those pagan Canaanites, and only to the most depraved of their own kings, as illustrative of the consequences of permitting foreign religion to permeate Israelite culture. In fact, in some later traditions, the conquest and destruction of Canaanite communities were justified on precisely this basis. Nevertheless, in spite of the Bible's sweeping condemnations, at two formative moments at the heart of the biblical drama, God seems to require a human sacrifice. The first is in the book of Genesis, the story of Abraham the patriarch chosen by God as founder of his nation, though without child into his old age. After his wife, Sarah, miraculously gives birth to a son, Isaac, God, in a move that runs against every expectation, demands that he sacrifice the child on Mount Moriah. In the end, as it turns out, God provides a ram for the sacrifice in place of the child, and we learned that the entire exercise was simply a test of Abraham's faithfulness. Yet, the dreadful possibility of such a divine demand remains, even as many later interpreters would allegorize the story in order to soften its troubling implications. A second example comes from Christian scripture, that is, the death of Jesus. 
Now, from a historical perspective, of course, it seems clear that Jesus' execution at the hands of the Romans was brought on by long-standing political tensions exacerbated by their imperial occupation of Judea. Yet, for his earliest followers, the death of Jesus came quickly to be interpreted as much more than this. The Apostle Paul, the earliest Christian writer, was convinced that Christ's death was for people in the sense that it was required by God in order to affect reconciliation with a wayward humanity. And thus, as in the case of Abraham and Isaac, a human sacrifice is placed at the very foundation of the Christian religion. Together, these two stories establish self-chosen death as a unique act of religious devotion, one that God may expect from those who are truly obedient. For ancient Jews and Christians, this often took the form of martyrdom at the hands of hostile rulers as a culminating expression of spiritual self-sacrifice. So to the extent that any of us is an inheritor of Judeo-Christian culture, these founding moments involving human sacrifice have left a permanent mark. And they compel us, perhaps, to recognize that such phenomena do not belong merely to distant times and places, such that we can conveniently consign them to the work of others as ancient, unenlightened pagans. Rather, at this moment, when a stunning archaeological discovery from Mount Lycaon has situated human sacrifice back again within the public consciousness, we may be provoked to reevaluate the ways in which our own society fails adequately to treat every human individual life as valuable. Thank you, and I will pass the mic over to Karen. If I can take just another moment or two, we, those of us from Mount Lacan would like to thank our many donors uh, to the project, uh, large and small. We have over 50 individual donors and we have a number of different foundations uh, that have supported us over the years. And this is a list of some of the, the, the most major of our donors um, uh, since 2004. We are hosting a Friends of Mount Lacan event at Athens on 4th um, on October 30, 2016, we invite you all to come, every single one of you. Um, it's at 4.30, 4.30 to 6.30. We would be delighted to see you there. Uh, you will learn more about Mount Lacan, and um, we, will, uh, we also have some good things to eat and drink, and um, uh, it's a, it should be a very nice occasion. We have some on the table behind here. We have some invitations to the Athens on 4th event. Uh, we also have some donor cards uh, for you to take home and think about. Uh, and we have uh, some brochures from our 2015 season, a summary of our, our work at, at Mount Lacan. And finally, we have two websites. Uh, these are the websites which we would um, interest you in, in uh, looking at uh, to keep up to date with what we're doing. So thank you very much for coming. Mm -hmm.